Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with our August 2018 teleseminar. Uh, thanks for watching. Before we begin, I want to uh, give you two warnings. The first one is that uh, I am trying not to answer questions submitted by people who have not read my book, Diabetes Solution. Um, the, these seminars are for people who have read the book. Um, it's to fill in things that may not be covered in the book. Uh, also, I am trying not to answer long questions where there's uh, a page of uh, query. Uh, I'll answer a, a, a brief paragraph. Um, the other uh, thing to point out is that my responses to your questions are really guesses. I haven't examined the, quest the patient. I haven't gotten the full medical history of the patient. Um, there's no way that I can have enough information to give good medical advice, but I can give interesting information for the other listeners. So it's very possible that my suggestions might not be appropriate to the person who submits the question. Uh, first question. Oh, before we begin, I have a few things to cover that relate to blood sugar uh, meters and also to continuous self-monitoring devices. Uh, there's been uh, a new regulation or an unregulation uh, submitted by the FDA in the, I'm sorry, submitted by Medicare in the USA. Uh, until recently, Medicare banned the use of continuous glucose monitors that had a follower option where another person could see your blood sugars and uh, send an emergency uh, unit over if you uh, did not reply to their warnings to uh, take some glucose to treat a low blood sugar uh, or even uh, to deal with high blood sugars. Um, I predicted on one of my videos some months ago that sooner or later um, some congressmen with diabetes in their family would get together and set things straight. In fact, I said it would probably take a vote of Congress. Well, what actually did happen and has been reported uh, is that uh, s several congressmen uh, complained to the director of Medicare uh, about uh, this regulation, which had no logical scientific or health reason for it, and probably uh, was born of connections with companies that did not provide uh, follower systems. Um, the whole thing's been reversed. And uh, within a matter of weeks to a couple of months, uh, Medicare will be paying for systems that allow followers. So I will no longer have to pay for my Dexcom system, which I've been paying for for years. Um, the other uh, point that I'd like to talk about has to do with uh, studies of the accuracy of blood sugar meters and of continuous glucose monitors, uh, even those associated with insulin pumps. Uh, one has to be leery of the ratings um, because frequently the, the individuals who do the studies or write the ratings are associated with manufacturers of uh, these pieces of equipment. So there may be uh, uh, a setup uh, in the uh, ratings. Another thing, and there have been several, there was recently a published uh, rating of blood sugar meters, and there was also a published rating of continuous glucose monitors. Um, one thing I noticed in the reports, both of the meters and the monitors, is that the 
data was not broken down by blood sugar level so that the reports don't tell you this meter is the most accurate at blood sugars over 200, this is the most accurate at blood sugars in the normal range, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and since uh, we're seeking blood sugars in the normal range, we don't care if a meter is inaccurate at blood sugars of 300 or 400 or even 200. Uh, so unless a, a rating system gives you a breakdown of where these meters uh, are accurate or inaccurate, we have no information as to whether they'll be useful for us because we're looking for the normal range. So you have to be careful when you look at these ratings. You also have to be careful when you look at ratings that uh, evaluate much more than accuracy. Um, for example, several a year or so ago, Consumer Reports, a magazine in the USA, reviewed blood sugar meters and rated them principally upon the number of special features that they had rather than upon their accuracy. So uh, just a warning, be careful, don't necessarily believe what you see in these uh, reports. First question, my husband has been impl implementing your protocol for about four months now with good results. However, he is puzzled by blood glucose spikes he gets after exercising at the gym. He does mostly resistance workouts with some uh, cardio. How would he go about preventing the big spike? Well, I've seen this in some of my patients, not all of them. And I concluded, uh, or I made a guess, that... Uh, the activity increases the production of stress hormones, epinephrine, cortisol, growth hormone, um, and uh, that the activity was not strenuous enough to offset the glucose increase caused by the stress hormones. Um, so I asked these people to take a small dose of propranolol, which is a beta blocker, that inhibits the production of epinephrine, which is probably the major stress hormone that you make when you exercise. And uh, to, uh, I wasn't surprised, but I was uh, encouraged by the fact that indeed a small dose of propranolol, about 10 milligrams, taken an hour to an hour and a half before the exercise, uh, tends to pre prevent this spike. I can't guarantee that it'll prevent it for your husband, but there's a good chance that it may. So your doctor can prescribe it, and you have to experiment a little with the timing. Uh, for some people, taking it a half hour before works, so I'd experiment with a half hour, an hour, and an hour and a half. I don't think you have to go any longer than an hour and a half in advance, and a half hour might work. My husband is on glimapidic, yeah, which is uh, a sulfonylurea, victosa, and metformin. He would like to lose at least 40 pounds. Can he go on insulin for a short time while he loses weight and then go back to his previous medication? He is having trouble losing weight. Well... I'm answering this question anyway, even though clearly uh, this wife did not read my book and probably her husband didn't, uh, because they would know that uh, excess insulin fosters weight gain, not weight loss. Uh, they also would know, if they had read my book, that a sulfonylurea uh, can foster weight gain also. Uh, if you're getting uh, too high a dose, it can cause your blood sugars to go low, forcing you to be hungry and overeat and thereby gain weight. So I certainly wouldn't be using a sulfonylurea. He would have to really 
look at my book, Diabetes Solution, to find out how to use insulin in such a manner that he can cut way back on the carbohydrate. Um, and uh, uh, the metformin is a good choice because uh, it frequently, not always, curbs uh, the desire to overeat and um, lowers insulin resistance so that if you do have to inject insulin, you can inject a smaller dose. Um, so the key point here is that insulin will foster weight gain, especially if you use it to cover excess carbohydrate. My husband was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and was put on metformin, which he took for a year. Recently, he was diagnosed with type 1, and he stopped taking the metformin out of fear that the drug caused him to become type 1. Can the drug t trigger type 1? I would say absolutely not. Um, if anything, uh, it might lower the likelihood by uh, lowering the blood sugars, and we know that uh, elevated blood sugars are toxic to beta cells, and although it, it's, I'm sure it's not just elevated blood sugars that has caused his, him to develop type 1, uh, it is one of the factors. So uh, if he's overweight um, or insulin resistant, even though he's now a type 1, he would probably be wise to continue the metformin and maybe lower the insulin doses. Again, this is a job for reading, this is a situation where you should be reading my book, Diabetes Solution, which I believe deals with people who uh, take both metformin and insulin. Since you don't recommend insulin pens, how do you inject Receba? Do you extract it with a regular insulin syringe? Well, I didn't, I don't recall not recommending insulin pens. In fact, I don't think anywhere in the book do I speak against insulin pens. Um, I do point out that there's a big problem with leakage from the injection site in people who use insulin pens. And there's another problem in that insulin pens uh, cannot be set for injecting half units and quarter units. So for little children, they uh, may be inappropriate. Also, uh, they're, uh, they don't contain diluted insulin as uh, children may require. Um, uh, I do use Traceba and uh, I use a pen and maybe I'm doing something that's a little bit inappropriate, but uh, I first, when I give an injection, I hold the button down for about 40 seconds. Then I release the button, leaving the needle still in my skin for another 40 seconds. And usually I get uh, little if no leakage. Uh, if I think, if, and I rub my hand on the skin after the injection to see if it's wet, and if I feel that it's wet, I'll inject one more unit uh, to replace what was lost. That's not as precise as I would tell my patients to do, uh, and I do have several patients who are using an ordinary insulin syringe to extract the traceba from the traceba cartridges. Uh, they don't even put the cartridges in the pen. They uh, deal. They, they hold them up to the syringe and let the, stick the needle in the cartridge. Um, uh, it's pretty obvious how you can do this. Uh, the one catch is you must pull back the plunger on the syringe very slowly because as you're withdrawing Traceba insulin, the gasket at the other end of the cartridge is moving, and there's a lot of friction there. And if you uh, pull rapidly, the gasket won't move, and you'll have vacuum in your uh, syringe, 
and that vacuum will draw some bubbles up from the back of the syringe from the far end of the plunger. What about juicing? I started juicing recently, roughly 80% vegetables and 20% fruits. Do you think I should juice with 100% vegetables or no juicing at all? Well, this is covered in my book, Diabetes Solution. Uh, it reminds me of something that happened when I was first in practice back in 1983. Back then, the ADA uh, uh, was claiming that a product called V8 juice, it was a vegetable juice that came in cans, uh, contained no carbohydrate. And uh, I actually, in my first book, uh, claimed that it had no carbohydrate. And my patients started to use it. And after every glass of V8 juice, their blood sugars would go very high. Very high by my standards, not by ADA standards. And they point, I learned from my patients that uh, just juicing vegetables would uh, free up a lot of sugar because you're taking uh, a polymer uh, of glucose, namely uh, the fiber that's in the vegetables, chopping it up until it's smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you've juiced it so it's a liquid, uh, you've literally created a lot of free glucose molecules. So I'm totally against juicing. Can you tell us exact references for the studies which you mentioned that show how insulin regime is pretty safe? I did read and gave to my doctor the many authored study which showed low carb led to lower complications. She wasn't interested, but maybe the studies on low insulin will convince her that I could be trusted with insulin. Um, well, uh, maybe the study I was referring to was the study published in, P in the journal Pediatrics, July 9th, 2018, uh, uh, summarizing what we found in the people on type 1 grit, that, that uh, Facebook group on the internet, who was... Who was uh, using my regimen uh, with low carbohydrate and low insulin doses. Um, that's the one thing that I can think of. I don't know what else you might be referring to. Um, if she's not interested, if she thinks that she, she can't trust you to take insulin, maybe there's some other reason that has to do with you and not to do with the, the insulin. Insulin can be hazardous if you use it incorrectly. Um, you might want to read my book, Diabetes Solution. Uh, there are a number of doctors, uh, especially endocrinologists, who don't believe in normal blood sugars and um, want blood sugars to be high. And there, there you might... Uh, uh, speak frankly with your doctor and tell her that uh, you know that high blood sugars cause the complications of diabetes. Uh, why does she want your blood sugars to be high if that's the case? Type 1 for 30 years. I've read your book and I brought my A1C down to 4.6, which is normal. I recently noticed the change in my metabolism, slowing down and struggled for months to stabilize. I don't know how this person knows that. Um, what advice do you have for women to make the transition to menopause easier? Well, the, I guess the easiest way to check your metabolism is to look at your heart rate. And if you have any record of what your heart rate was before your metabolism slowed, and it's lower now, it could be that um, uh, 
uh, you become hypothyroid. Another possibility is that um, you had autonomic neuropathy before from the high blood sugars, and now that um, uh, your blood sugars are normal, the neuropathy is improving and your heart rate is slowing. Uh, probably, uh, if you're tired, if that's why you think you have a low metabolism, you should uh, have your thyroid function checked. And I would start with the free T3, which is the most important single test for evaluating thyroid function. And then if that is low, you'd have to do some other tests too. And we go into that in the book, I believe. We've been reading through your book and are both incredibly grateful and incredibly angry. My boyfriend has been a type 1 di diabetic for decades and has learned more about managing his condition in the past month than the preceding 18 years. We need a new doctor. Is it better for the new doctor to specialize in cardiology, neurology, or pulmonary care? We are particularly concerned about restoring the function of his vagus nerve. Well, I would think that uh, what you need is a kindly family practice physician uh, who will uh, allow you to ha allow him to have normal blood sugars. Um, uh, there are many physicians who uh, advocate the ADA guidelines, which are for high blood sugars. Um, so, uh, in fact, if you can get a family physician who would read my book, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, I don't know why you would want a cardiologist or a pulmonary doctor or even a neurologist. Uh, the complications of diabetes are caused by high blood sugars, and many of them, especially the neurologic ones, uh, can be reversed by normal blood sugars. What A1C numbers and time and range is optimal for type 1 diabetes? I would say the same thing that's optimal for the general population. And, uh, of course, there are variations with the laboratory you use, but... Uh, for most laboratories, I would say uh, 4.6 to 4.8% for a lifetime would be optimal. What are the steps for splitting up your long-acting insulin from one dose at night to half at night and half in the morning? Um, again, this is a reason to read my book, Diabetes Solution. Um, although uh, I usually recommend starting with half and half, uh, there's the possibility that if you move half to the morning and have been taking uh, pre-meal insulin, rapid-acting insulin during the day, that if you take the long-acting in the morning, you'll need less insulin before meals. So uh, certainly you'll have to get very frequent blood sugar measurements. You might want to check them every hour or two uh, during the daytime uh, uh, to see what happens, what's going to happen to your pre-meal doses. And I certainly recommend that you read my book. What can be done about very severe neuropathy pain? Again, uh, we actually have a chapter in the book that uh, deals with what you can expect after you've normalized blood sugars. And what we do see is reversal of neuropathy. There are many doctors prescribing uh, a variety of painkillers to kill the pain until the nerves are totally dead and you can't feel anything. But my approach is to normalize blood sugars and uh, allow the neuropathy to uh, get to self-repair over time. Now, there's one little catch 
with regard to neuropathy pain, and we do talk about that in the book, that uh, let's say that you have someone with feet that are numb, and you normalize his blood sugars, and two months later, he's experiencing terrible pain in his feet because as the nerves re-sprout, it can be very painful. And you could have this terrible pain for two, three, four or more months while the nerves are regrowing. And then eventually they regrow and you can feel things again and don't have pain, but it takes a while. And what I've seen with people is if they've been warned in advance that it's going to be very painful for a while while their nerves heal, uh, they can tolerate it uh, because they know it's going to be better. What kind of magnesium supplement should I take and how much? Number one, how do you know that you need a magnesium supplement? And there is the possibility that you could get too much magnesium. And there are many ty types of magnesium, some of which are insoluble uh, in water and uh, irritate the colon, cause diarrhea. That's why we have uh, uh, milk of magnesia and other magnesium products to treat constipation. So uh, uh, what I would do is um, uh, first check my red blood cell magnesium level and see if it's in the normal range. Uh, not serum magnesium, but red blood cell magnesium. And if it's below the normal range, you could try magnesium L-threonate, T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E. -E. Can auto, what, sorry, wrong page. What tests should be run to determine your diabetes situation? Well, the most important test is to measure your blood sugar uh, one and two hours after meals. And uh, for most diabetics, uh, they should be measuring uh, multiple times per day, uh, as indicated in my book, until they get their regimen uh, finally at a place when they have normal blood sugars, and that means their diet and whatever medications they're taking. Medications have to be, doses have to be adjusted, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a simple matter. And uh, the treatment is based upon what your blood sugars are over the course of the day, throughout the day at different times. Uh, so the most important thing is the blood sugar. You could also look at the hemoglobin A1c which gives you a rough idea of what your average blood sugar has been over the past three or four months. Um, but it doesn't tell you, give you clues as to what to do about it. You, you mentioned in a previous teleseminar that you suffered from sho frozen shoulder. Were you able to perform weightlifting exercise during this time? If so, which ones? I'm having a difficult time knowing which exercises can make my shoulder worse. Well, <laughs> I was able to do weightlifting exercises, uh, but they were with lower weights, much lower weights than they were after I got my shoulder uh, working better. It took a lot of physical therapy to get my sh frozen shoulder uh, working again. Uh, uh, and I, but I never gave up any of the exercises I was doing. The um, uh, overhead um, press, uh, chest press, et cetera, uh, which uh, can be difficult with a frozen shoulder, uh, I was doing with light, lighter weights. Now I'm using heavier weights. Um, but it's a good idea to see 
either a physical therapist or a um, doctor of rehabilitation medicine or a doctor of sports medicine for advice on how to treat the frozen shoulder. Now, if you've had high blood sugars and are going to continue to have high blood sugars, you're not going to make it better uh, because you're continuing the damage uh, to the collagen in the connective tissue in your shoulder. Uh, so uh, the game plan should be first control the blood sugars and then you can uh, actually normalize the blood sugars and then you could get the frozen shoulder treated. You mention in your ebook on type 2 diabetes that there is a new medication being developed that would cause the kidneys to excrete glucose at lower blood sugar levels, thereby reducing the level of sugar in your blood before it gets too high. Are these SGL2 inhibitors and do they work? Yes, I was talking about SGL2 inhibitors, uh, which are uh, heavily marketed right now. Many claims are being made for them, uh, for example, that they lower the incidence of heart attacks and things like that. I seriously question the claims outside of those relating to blood sugar because anything that lowers blood sugar is going to reduce the rate of heart attacks. Um, there are problems with these, uh, namely uh, a high incidence of urinary tract infections, a uh, hazard of dehydration, I have maybe one or two people who are taking it. It can be very effective at lowering blood sugar by, uh, on average, 10 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. Um, but uh, you will be urinating a lot more. You're going to have to drink a lot more fluid. And uh, I have seen people... Uh, with uh, elevated hematocrits and changes in their uh, serum electrolyte levels uh, as a result of uh, these drugs. And therefore, I do not use them routinely. I'll use them as a last resort. Uh, for example, if I have a patient who's a flyer, uh, flies airplanes, and will not be permitted to fly if he takes insulin, uh, I might have them on a combination of medications in addition to a very low-carb diet and exercise. And uh, we might have one of these SGL2 inhibitors along with the other meds. But we'd have to check frequent hematocrits, electrolyte levels, and uh, he'd have to drink a lot of water. Um, type 2 male. I've been on the low-carb diet and max dose of glucophage for the last five years. I lowered my A1C from fifth. Wow, I can't believe this. From 15.6 to seven. 15.6 is about the highest hemoglobin A1C I ever heard of. Two months ago, I started taking 16 units a day of regular insulin to cover my meals. My BG is between 78 and 90 all the time. If I maintain normal blood sugar, will my high LP small a normalize? How long might it take? Um, uh, LP small a uh, is what's, amongst other things, is an acute phase reactant. It goes up when you have inflammation in the body. The inflammation, inflammation can be caused by a host of things. It could be uh, from some autoimmune diseases, from infection, um, uh, from uh, medications, uh, from herbal products, uh, and I don't know, and it can be inherited. I have several patients who have inherited LP, elevated LP small a. Um, I don't think, I have not seen, I should say, uh, a relation between LP small a and blood sugar. Um, 
I've had patients who came to me with elevated LP small a and normalized their blood sugars and it didn't change. Um, uh, women with uh, elevated LP small a frequently are elevated because they have low estrogen levels and replacing the estrogen can lower the LP small a. Um, I believe we have spoken on my t uh, teleseminars about um, uh, medications and supplements that you can take to lower LP small a, but I don't think it's blood sugar lowering. I don't think that will change the situation. Seventy-five-year-old female diagnosed November 2016 with diabetic ketoacidosis and type 1 diabetes after six infusions of immunotherapy drug Opdivo. I don't drink coffee or tea and want a drink that is not, that is hot. I've attempted to create a substitute hot chocolate whose components have very few or no carbs. One tablespoon cocoa powder, one cup almond milk, three quarter teaspoon Da Vinci sugar-free French vanilla syrup, one quarter teaspoon of vanilla, seven drops of liquid stevia, Yet my blood sugar rises 30 to 40 milligrams per deciliter. What am I doing wrong? Well, she, she tells us, because she also tells us that her cocoa powder has three grams of carb. Her almond milk has one gram of carbs. That's four. And uh, if she's, and she probably is uh, a slim person, uh, I weigh about 115 pounds, and one gram of carbohydrate will raise my blood sugar by eight. So she's getting four grams of carbohydrate. That would raise her four times eight, or 32. And uh, I believe what she's complaining of, uh, her blood sugar rises 30 to 40. Well, 32 is in that range, 30 to 40. She probably weighs a little less than me, and maybe those four grams will raise her 35. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, any carbohydrate they eat is going to raise your blood sugar. And she's, in effect, done the calculations for me uh, without knowing it. And you can see that she's getting what she what should expect. I reduced my carb intake A1C down to 5.7. Once daily finger stick before dinner, anywhere between 94 and 112. Weigh uh, was 178 pounds, now 162. Doctor tried to put me on metformin. I am trying to hold off on taking any medication, wondering if you think this is a good idea, always wondering how long I can hold off. Well, met metformin years ago, uh, before it became available in the USA, was touted as the fountain of youth, uh, that uh, it would extend the lives of non-diabetics who took metformin. And there have been found a number of benefits unrelated to diabetes uh, related to metformin. So I don't think it's a hazardous substance. Um, in some people it can cause diarrhea, especially if not used properly. Um, if uh, In some people it can cause malabsorption of vitamin B12, but there are ways around that. So I don't think that uh, there's strong reason to avoid the metformin and this person is t checking blood sugar before dinner, 
he should be checking one or two hours after dinner. And I'm willing to bet that his blood sugars are much higher than he's stated uh, or than it is before. And an A1C of 5.7 is an average blood sugar of about 128, but in all likelihood, he's going much higher and also lower than 128 and averaging 128. So uh, uh, it would seem to me that something else has to be done. Uh, uh, it might, might be just exercise, I don't know. But uh, uh, yeah, certainly this patient should read my book. Uh, can autoimmune attack in a child with type 1 be reversed with food or supplements? No. Don't look for magical things. Um, we did speak uh, at my last teleseminar about an experimental study with the drug verapamil, and uh, this may or may not work. It, it certainly is worth trying, but uh, if you have a type 1 child, you should be, uh, that child is entitled to normal blood sugars, and you should be doing everything you can to normalize the blood sugars. So visit Type 1 Grit on the uh, on Facebook, G-R-I-T. Uh, read my book, Diabetes Solution. Um, your doctor may want to experiment with verapamil. Uh, it's uh, a reasonably benign drug, but may not come in doses small enough for a small child. Um, uh, it's a matter of experimentation. Can you be on a keto diet if you have type 1 diabetes? I guess you can be on any kind of a diet if you have type 1 diabetes, but uh, if you want to survive, you have to be careful. And it depends on the diet. And uh, many of these so-called keto diets are commercial ventures that are not necessarily health, uh, healthy. Uh, I've had a number of people come in uh, looking very unhealthy, following what they called keto diets that were not giving them enough protein. And um, this idea of trying to get the ketones in your blood as high as possible uh, doesn't really make sense. Uh, if you're getting enough protein, uh, that may prevent the ketones in your blood from going up because... Uh, uh, protein uh, can uh, actually raise the blood sugar, um, but very slowly and slow enough to be balanced by the rapid-acting insulins that we use. Carbohydrate works too fast for uh, the rapid-acting insulins. Can you convert the vegetable portions into ounces? Well, I assume this means recipes in one of my books and one cup of uh, vegetables uh, is eight fluid ounces and of course the amount of vegetables you're getting depends upon how they're cut and so on and so forth um, if you're uh, asking for how much weight of vegetables uh, I can't do it over the teleseminar. And it would take a lot of book uh, to write a new book. Uh, uh, I probably do not have time for right now. I'm certain I don't have time for. Cleaning up chronic DVTs with your diabetic diet. Well, a DVT is a deep vein thrombosis. And I don't quite understand how my diet is going to uh, reverse deep vein thromboses. These are clots in uh, deep veins. Um, my dad is 68, diabetic since 27, and was told that he has chronic, non-symptomatic clots in his legs and abdomen. I have gotten him eating low-carb, 
reduced overall insulin needs, reduced A1C, last was 8.1, which is pretty high. Uh, that's an average blood sugar of, let's see, um, about 220 milligrams per deciliter. So it's like two and a half times normal. Um, and he lost 26 pounds. My goal is to get him more active, but he is always fatigued. Can your diet help clear up these boulders? That's as the vascular surgeon calls them. Um, I, I have no idea. I, I doubt it. Um, uh, perhaps if you are dealing with a young person and giving them several years uh, by uh, high blood sugars tend to bring with them elevated fibrinogen levels. And when fibrinogen comes down, blood's less likely to clot and uh, things might clear up over many years in a very young, in a much younger person. Um, uh, the vascular surgeon uh, might want to sclerose his veins. Um, that sometimes works. Uh, but I doubt that uh, just eating low carb is going to make uh, the difference. Can you explain the honeymoon concept in newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics? Is it possible for the pancreas to continue making some insulin? Again, this is covered in my book. Uh, usually, uh, new type 1 diabetics are still making insulin. You could check that with a C-peptide test. And um, uh, sometimes we're able to arrest further destruction by preventing high blood sugars, by keeping blood sugars normal. And I do have several patients who've had type 1 patients who've had uh, normal blood sugars for many years, you know, 20, 30 years, and uh, their insulin doses have never gone up. So uh, too bad I didn't catch my own blood sugars early on. Uh, but uh, that's the story. Uh, uh, no guarantee that normalizing blood sugars will prevent it because you could get another autoimmune attack. But if you don't get any further autoimmune attacks, uh, high blood sugars are toxic to the beta cells, and just having high blood sugars could uh, destroy more beta cells. Please let me know if you believe there is a connection between Hashimoto's thyroiditis and diet. There are popular ideas out there that through special diet, one can decrease the immune attack towards the thyroid. Uh, well, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is uh, an immune attack on the thyroid. There is some indication that people who are selenium or zinc defendant, de 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 who <laughs> deficient, um, can develop, uh, well, let's say zinc, iodine, uh, or selenium deficient, can develop hypothyroidism, not Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an inflammatory disorder, but poor functioning of the thyroid because it requires uh, these elements as cofactors uh, in the production of uh, thyroid hormones. So if you're de you can check your blood levels of zinc, iodine, and selenium, and if you're deficient in any of those, you uh, take replacement doses, and um, maybe your hypothyroidism would get better. But mere hypothyroidism is not the same as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an inflammatory disorder. 
uh, it can eventually destroy the thyroid, and then you're in the same boat uh, as someone who's had the thyroid removed. Do you have a list of doctors that follow your diet plans and such, or are you taking on new patients at all? Um, I know of two doctors who follow uh, my regimens with their patients. One is in Mexico and one is in Bahrain. I don't know of any in the USA. I know of one naturopath in the USA who is a type 1 diabetic and follows my regimen for himself. I have never been in his office, so I don't know uh, uh, how he is with his patients. I would assume that he may be using my book. Uh, and those are the only people I know of. Uh, I know of a number of type 1 diabetic physicians who use my book for themselves, but there's a problem. Uh, to spend the amount of time that I spend with a new patient uh, is too costly for physicians. They can't afford it. Uh, uh, insurance will not pay for a doctor to train a patient. Uh, uh, most insurance plans will pay for a nurse in a certain setting, maybe in a group practice or in a hospital, uh, to train patients, but not for a physician to do that. So, yeah, I'm still in practice, but um, uh, a patient spends three days here just for the training, and then we fine-tune them over the telephone looking at their blood sugar da data sheets. Have you been able to diagnose and reverse any classes of metabolic syndrome, any cases of metabolic syndrome? Well, yeah, with weight loss. Um, uh, these are people with slightly high blood sugars. They may have high blood pressure, and they're usually uh, quite obese, and some of them are able to lose weight. And... Uh, when they lose weight, uh, uh, a lot of these problems either are reduced or disappear if the weight loss is adequate. My question is concerning coconut milk. I see ingredient guar gum in all the coconut uh, Choices. Is guar gum safe for our daughter or will it raise her blood sugar? Guar gum is probably pretty benign stuff, but coconut milk uh, has sugar in it. Um, uh, a typical coconut milk has eight tenths of a gram of carbohydrate per tablespoon. So if you have eight ounces, that's I believe 16 tablespoons would be 13 grams of carbohydrate. Um, and for someone who weighs my weight, uh, 13 grams would raise me, uh, of which 8 grams is pure sugar, um, uh, possibly pure glucose. Uh, so that 13 grams would raise me by 8 times 13, or 104, and if this daughter weighs half my weight, it would raise her 208. So uh, this parent is uh, uh, pretty much on the wrong track when it comes to treating diabetes. I suggest you read my book, Diabetes Solution. Hello, Dr. Bernstein. I'm a 41-year-old male and 25-year type 1 diabetic, so this guy is a survivor. I have recently been diagnosed with pernicious anemia. I would like to know if there's anything you think I should be aware of or anything that you recommend given this diagnosis. Well, uh, this uh, is usually due to a vitamin B12 deficiency, and you can ask your local doctor about that, but... I warn everybody that 
some people who take metformin uh, will experience binding of the metformin to B12 receptors in the gut, leading to, uh, let's call it malabsorption of B12. And you can check the blood for this by looking not just for serum B12 level, but also for uh, methylmalonic acid, which would be elevated, and homocysteine, which would be elevated if you're B12 deficient. So if you're taking metformin, that could be a cause of the B12 deficiency. And um, uh, one of the solutions is to uh, take calcium with the metformin, like a Tums pill with every metformin tablet. Now, most doctors don't give metformin for type 1 diabetes, but I use it for uh, a number of overweight type 1 diabetics and uh, also for special other situations with type 1 diabetics. Um, but you should ask your doctor uh, to have this studied. I'm a newly diagnosed LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And as I pointed out before, uh, I think this condition is being overdiagnosed. Uh, uh, the people whom I've seen uh, uh, with, the, with uh, type 1 diabetes uh, developed at a, a later age uh, usually just had plain type 1 diabetes and there was nothing special about it. Um, with the blood, with a hemoglobin A1C of 9.6, should I go on insulin or should I try a radical diet at this stage? Uh, that A1C is an average blood sugar of 280. So my guess is that unless you're eating uh, a lot of sweet foods, um, you're going to need insulin. And I suggest that you read your book, read my book. Um, uh, if you want to go to a low-carb diet and you're already on a high-carb diet, you go for a few days and you should see a dramatic drop of your blood sugars. And if your blood sugars come down to normal, uh, just by cutting out all the excess carbohydrate, uh, uh, then you may not need insulin. But my guess is that you probably won't find that kind of a drop. I would like to know if it is possible to be off of medication if we follow your low-carb diet. I have type 2 diabetes and taking metformin. The purpose of my diet is not to get people off medication. Um, I think that you should do whatever it takes to keep blood sugars absolutely normal. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Uh, if, uh, if, the, uh, if the diet and the metformin give you normal blood sugars around the clock, fine. But uh, if they don't, you should read the book and uh, there are many options for type 2 diabetes. My son, 10 years old, just hit his one year since his diagnosis. We needed insulin for the first couple of weeks and then started low carb and healthy eating and have not needed insulin for almost a year. A1C was 8.5 at diagnosis. Have you heard of people being type 1 and of not needing insulin? He has the antibody for type 1. All his doctors mentioned possibly having MODI, it's maturity onset diabetes of youth, but then told us no because of the present antibody. A1C now 5.2. It's an average blood sugar of around 108. Um, blood, uh, blood, oh yeah, it ranges between 4.8 and 5.2. I would do 
uh, whatever it takes to keep blood sugars normal. And for 10-year-old kids, normal blood sugars are in the 70s, not 108. So uh, this kid is running about 50% above normal. Um, uh, I would certainly think that something should be done to uh, bring him into a normal range. And uh, uh, the family should read my book, Diabetes Solution. It seems that my blood sugar value is accentuated by gastroparesis. My glucose measurement in the morning depends a lot from what I eat for my dinner the night before. I take glucophage that time. No, I take glucophage. What time do you think that I should take this medi medication? Well, uh, first of all, I would think you should ask your doctor to get the glucophage XR, which is the time release stuff. Uh, experiment by taking it uh, right after dinner uh, and seeing what happens. But read my book. It might take, a, I have a whole chapter on gastroparesis. You might need the medications for gastroparesis, um, and you might need other medications for blood sugar. Uh, but one experiment your doctor might want to try is glucophage XR uh, at bedtime. Or, I'm sorry, after, the din after dinner. And that'll be lasting all night. So I think we've done it for today. Thanks for listening. Have a good month.